When we added MDMA, what will you do? Went up to 61%. Uh, hell yes. But I saw a bird that morning. He made the first blue in 200 years. Have you ever wondered how the post-it was discovered? We use post-it notes all the time. For that matter, how about microwave oven, Velcro, X-rays, or even tire? They were all discovered by serendipity or by accidents. The word serendipity was first coined by Horace Walpole based on a Persian tale, Three Princes of Serendip. Serendip is the ancient name for Sri Lanka. In this tale, the three princes were discovering fortunate things which they are not looking for by accident and also by sagacity or by keen sense. In science, we use serendipity quite often when lucky breaks turn into breakthrough discoveries. Let me give you a couple of examples. Teflon. Teflon was discovered by a DuPont chemist, Roy Plunkett, in 1940s. He was not looking for Teflon. When he opened a cylinder of tetrafluoroethylene, a gas, no gas came out. He was very puzzled and curious. And after some thinking, he said, I need to find out what happened. So he took a drill and made a hole in the cylinder. He didn't see any gas, but he only saw the powder, white powder. That was Teflon. DuPont made billions of dollars out of this discovery. The next one is Viagra. <laughs> Viagra is an exciting discovery. <laughs> when Nicholas Turret tried to create a molecule which he thought it would cure angina, which is the chest pain, but it didn't work. So when Pfizer find out it didn't work, they would like to get the drugs back from the public. Women returned the drug, men did not. <laughs> so they were curious. The scientists themselves took the drug, and finally, after half an hour, wow. <laughs> That's how the Viagra was born. Pfizer made billions of dollars out of this discovery. Let's now fast forward to Oregon State University. The serendipitous discovery in my lab really startled the world. In 2008, I received a grant from the National Science Foundation to design a compound which can revolutionize the computer industry. So for this purpose, I choose four elements in the periodic table, yttrium, indium, manganese, and oxygen. I thought that would do the trick. So I, then I asked my graduate student to mix three chemicals, yttrium oxide, indium oxide, and manganese oxide. Please note the color. One is white, other one is yellow, and the other one is black. We mix them, heat them to very high temperatures. Next day morning, I walk into the lab. My student picked out a sample out of the furnace. I was shocked. Then I, because all the compound tended to be blue, which I did not expect, because manganese oxides are not supposed to be blue. In my experience of 40 years of doing research, I never seen manganese oxide produce such a blue. So I turned to my student. I said, what the heck happened here? <laughs> but that is not the four letter word I used. <laughs> we also could tune the color of the blue by simply changing the manganese to indium ratio, which has never been done. Immediately, I said, this is a discovery we should explore. So where did the color come from? Imagine a world without colors. It's boring. Now let's put the color on it. This is the village in Italy, actually. Each house is painted with different colors. Where did the color come from? When a white light strikes your object, part of the wavelength gets absorbed, part of the wavelength gets reflected. What we see is the reflected color. This depends on the, the, the chemical nature of the surface of the object. It can be a paint, for example. So every color here you see is a different chemistry. So where did our blue come from? Our blue come from, 
we don't know yet. Let us now look at the ruby and emerald. Ruby is red, emerald is green. We all know that. But both have chromium as a chromophore. But both but give different colors. So it is very difficult to predict the color of the compound before you make it in the lab. That's why nobody could see our blue color before for 200 years. So where does the blue come from in our N-min blue? Where the N-min comes from, the name comes from the yttrium, indium, and manganese. It comes from the manganese being situated in a very unusual structural arrangement. The manganese is located surrounded by five oxygens that reflect only blue and absorb red and green. As soon as we, I realized that this is an interesting discovery, we filed a patent and also we published the work in a very premier journal. As soon as the publication came out, I was mobbed by the mainstream media. First, I got a call from New York Times and NBC News, CBS News and NPR and even Washington Post. Well, okay, some of you may think it's a fake news. <laughs> but it is not, because it is covered by Fox News. <laughs> Imagine a blue discovery from a blue state covered by Fox News. Clearly there is something we have done, it's amazing. And finally, to my surprise, on my daughter's excitement, our discovery came in Cosmopolitan, <laughs> Harper Bazaar, and even Teen Vogue. My daughter texted me, Dad, you really made it. <laughs> so why the blue is here? Okay, I wanna, there, there's a video in, uh, in, in social media which is seen by 15 million people about our blue discovery. It was, it was posted by Tech, Tech Insider. Only Lady Gaga gets that kind of uh, <laughs> views. So what can I say? Move over Lady Gaga, here comes the scientist Gaga. <laughs> so clearly, that our, why the blue is so fascinating? Blue is the most difficult color to make. Whenever you see blue color in nature, mostly it is not due to pigments. For example, morpho butterfly, peacock, anything, even blue eyes, they don't have atom of pigment in their the object. So why they appear so blue? because the way they light reflect from this object due to the nanostructure, where it only reflects the blue color selectively. If you look at the earlier prehistoric paintings, there were no blue, because blue is not an earthen color. You can't find, go and dig a backyard and get some blue pigment. First blue pigment came into existence 3,000 years BC when lapis lazuli was discovered in Afghanistan, which is a very brilliant blue color, where the blue color comes from the sulfur. So it is not very stable, but it is a beautiful blue. So Egyptians loved this beautiful blue, and they decorated their tombs and funerary marks with lapis lazuli. Same thing with medieval painters. They love the color of the blue of the lapis lazuli, and they used it in their creations. For example, when Michelangelo painted the Lost Judgment in Sistine Chapel, he demanded lapis lazuli, although it's more expensive than gold. The Egyptians had a problem because it has to come from Afghanistan. They tried to create their own blue, now it's called Egyptian blue, which is actually not a real blue, it's turquoise. So it is not very favorable to most of the artists. So there are only three blue pigments are known today, apart from that. One is a Persian blue, you may know, which is a iron cyanide, which is discovered in 1704. Cobalt blue, which we all know very well, which is discovered in 1802. But cobalt is carcinogen. So the companies have been looking for new blue for 200 years. So finally in 2009, at Oregon State University, we made the first blue, which is most vivid blue ever seen. Our blue is not simply a pretty blue. It can also reflect heat. That means if you paint your roof with this pigment or with a paint made from this pigment, it can reflect heat and keep the place cooler. 
So the automobile industry is also very much interested because most of the time when you have a hot climate, you have to use the white cars because it will reflect the heat. So this is the first time ever a blue pigment was discovered which can reflect heat. Artists have used our pigments all over the world. Uh, I have received hundreds and hundreds of emails asking me the sample of pigment. So clearly, it, this discovery has not only attracted the attention of the paint companies or the technological folks, it's also attracted the, the art world. In fact, to satisfy this, a company in, now in Australia make this blue pigment in the form of a paint for artists, and they call it Oregon Blue. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so definitely when I was in Sydney, I still remember that I walk into the store, I can see the blue pigment hanging in the stores for sale. I never imagined the discovery happened 15,000 miles away can give rise to this type of development where I can see something in the stores, what you discovered in the lab. I was also very excited about when Crayola called me and said they would like to introduce a new blue color based on our discovery. They had a contest all over the world to give some names for this blue because they didn't like the color Enmin blue, which is more scientific. <laughs> so, the kid, so they finally came up with a name based on the poll is beautiful. <laughs> so we did not stop this discovery with blue. As a chemist, as a scientist, it's not just say, I made the blue, but I want to say, can I design the other colors, understanding the chemistry of this blue? When we substituted iron for manganese, we made orange pigments. Or I'm sure, you know, OSU was very, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> then we decided we should try green now. <laughs> then we put copper for the manganese. We got a beautiful green colors. That made the University of Oregon happy. <laughs> and we also put some zinc and titanium for the manganese. We got purple. And the purple color is the color of the University of Washington. So we made the color of most of the colleges in the, in the Northwest. <laughs> what we are now looking for is a red color. Again, red is a very difficult pigment to make. Although nature makes red color, most of them containing cadmium, you know, the cadmium red, or it contains mercury, that's a vermilion. So we are looking for a red which will not have any toxic metals. So think about this discovery. We started with to make a compound which will revolutionize the electronic industry. But it end up in being in the crayon. <laughs> or it can be on your home. Or it can be on your car. So this is how the discovery happens. I always tell my students, you have to be prepared for the expecting the unexpected. I always like the the saying by, or the quote by, Louis Pasteur, a famous biologist, who said, luck favors the only prepared mind. So I want to wish you all the best. Thank you. <laughs>